We have to start exactly at 4 o'clock, and I'm so already 16 seconds behind. It is my uh, complete pleasure to welcome Jocelyn Hawthorne to a CFA for Colloquium. He's currently the ARC Laureate Fellow, Professor of Physics, and Director of the Sydney Institute for Astronomy. Uh, we met 30 years ago in Hawaii when he gave a colloquium at uh, the Physics Department, Wanami Hall, and I've seen many of his talks since then. They're always enjoyable. I haven't heard this one yet. Uh, his thorough recitation of achievements would erode his uh, talking time, so did his PhD at RGO as a student at the uh, University of Sussex, the first thesis on the Taurus Imaging Spectrograph. Uh, he was an IFA postdoc for three years when Nancy and I were at, uh, in Hawaii. In 1988, he became a tenured professor at uh, Rice, uh, then moved to a Federation Fellowship at the University of Sydney. Uh, let's see. It's a, it's a long recitation here. Um, he's uh, the uh, Federation Fellowship with a tenured professorship at uh, the Sydney Institute for Astronomy School of Physics, University of Sydney. He co-founded the Institute for Photonics and Optical Sciences. It's at this point worth remarking that Josh sort of has a, has a schizophrenic uh, career profile because on one hand he does all this really great observational astronomy, but then he has this huge... Uh, instrumentation and photonic experimentation and always uh, dazzling me with uh, his new new ideas. He's won a number of prizes, the W.H. Steele Medal from the Australian Optical Society, the Jackson Gwilt Medal from the Royal Astronomical Society in 2012, uh, and I guess you're actually now starting to venture into outer space with balloon-borne experiments, so you never cease, it never ceases to amaze me the breadth of uh, your activities and achievements. So without further ado, I'll give you Joss. Thank you very much. That was excruciating uh, to, to hear that. <laughs> Lyndon Bell always says before his talks, it's a series of half-truths and obfuscation, but we're, we're required to have websites. So I uh, apologize for, for, the, for, for that, for most of you. Um, OK, so you will have seen this. You'll know it's uh, one of these wonderful Harvard results. Uh, the beautiful Chandra bubbles. I've been told to stand near the table. I'm just and can you hear me now? Is that, is that on? Great. I'm actually six foot and a bit, so you should lower the camera a bit. I got my head chopped off. All right. So, um, and uh, I, I had a pointer. Here we go. So, in fact, I was um, dazzled by the NASA press release, um, even more so because while they didn't mention my earlier work prior to the Fermi bubbles, they did hint at it through these blue, beautiful blue biconal structures which are the X-ray emission that were detected in 2003. Uh, and when I saw this work, uh, I was immediately aware, to my mind, that this was what was going on here, that this was a, sort of a nuclear uh, explosion of, of some form. And in fact, Doug was kindly emailed me before the uh, paper came out to mention it found this wonderful signal. So my talk today will be about the consequences of such an event, and, and we've learned a lot more uh, since from, uh, from observations across the entire spectrum. So I want to go back to a paper I wrote in 2013, the fossil imprint of a powerful flare at the galactic center along the Magellanic stream. So the idea here now is that the bubble, so, so let me go back a bit and mention that there was a lovely workshop that uh, Blanford organized at Stanford on the Fermi bubbles. There were very few of us that went, maybe 25 or so. Uh, and, uh, and I think Doug was there and there were a lot of people working on the bubbles. And it was at that meeting that I suddenly realized that the energetics of the bubbles were even higher than what I had inferred from the X-ray emission, and that therefore the imaginary stream should be some kind of a screen of what was coming out of the galactic center. And I presented my first ideas uh, at that meeting, and those ideas became uh, this paper, and we acknowledge that workshop for the inspiration. So here's the uh, structure of my talk. I'll start by giving you the earlier work on galactic center winds, Aging or starburst, this is always the, the major problem. If you've read my annual reviews with Sylvain Verrier in 2005 on galactic winds, one of the things we fixate on is how difficult it is to distinguish any kind of AGN-driven activity at these low powers from a starburst activity. It's very difficult. I'll then get to this much like stream mystery, which is the idea of using the stream as some kind of screen for what's happening at the galactic nucleus. Um, this will get me on to time-dependent photonization. I presented my first results at the Stanford workshop that were based on calculations literally the night before the talk because I just heard uh, the, the uh, 
And you can do this. You can do simple calculations. Uh, and in fact, I, at that night, I was emailing uh, Ralph Sutherland back in Australia and said, you've got to get mappings back in action, and you've got to put time-dependent analyzation into it. So within the space of three months, he'd done this. I'd also emailed uh, Gary Furlan, who's a colleague and friend, and he was too busy with other wonderful things. So Ralph was the one that took the hook, took the bait. Uh, and this is now in mappings, called Mappings 4. And it's a very difficult thing to get right. We've worked pretty hard on this notion of time-dependent ionization. So I'll present new models. I'll also show you new results from wave bands like the HST cost ultraviolet results. And I'll end by saying something about the developing paradigm. This is not just my paradigm. There are many people doing beautiful work on flares and uh, coronal mass ejections and all sorts of incredible ideas. I know here at CFA there have been wonderful papers. I was reading some yesterday by Cerrone uh, on this sort of idea of, of, of sort of flickering stochastic behavior. To my mind, the, the case is completely obvious. But I hope to convince you that this is, this is for real. So the Galactic Center wind. So in a sense, I, I, I like to think of myself as John the Baptist preparing the way uh, uh, for uh, the Harvard result, uh, because I wrote this paper on the galactic center wind in hard x-rays. This is 1.5 keV. And you see this biconal structure. This is plus or minus 18 degrees in both latitude and longitude. Um, and this is the galactic center here. And this is beautiful biconic structure. We also presented mid-infrared results and came up with an energy of 10 to the 55 ergs. Um, and the referee, not surprisingly, took immediate exception to what we were saying. The referee said any kind of outflow near the, well, near the sun has to be local. The evidence for the North Galactic Polar Spur from polarization measurements, this argues that something like this must be local. So um, that stumped me for a while because I hadn't, I hadn't really kept in touch with the uh, sort of NG, the North Polar Spur literature. I hadn't gone back far enough to understand how much work had been done. Um, but my argument to the referee was twofold. The first argument was this is at 1.5 keV. The energy to absorption at these energies goes like minus 3.5 if you put in all the right metals. Uh, so if you go to the soft band at sort of 0.5 keV, you just don't see this biconic structure go all the way to the middle. So I used the opacity argument. In fact, a ROSAT opacity in the soft band is not different from the optical. They're very similar. So you just don't see further than, say, a few hundred, maybe a kiloparsec in soft. In hard, you can get all the way to the galactic center. That was my first argument. My second argument was from the lovely work by Naomi McClure Griffiths. She's an American uh, living in Australia who does this beautiful work on OB associations and blowouts. And I just asked Naomi, for sort of the 30 or so blowouts you've seen, have you ever checked for x-rays? And she says, yeah. And I, sometimes I see soft x-rays. I said, do you ever see hard x-rays? And she never does. So the fact that you don't see hard x-ray biconic structures in any of these blowouts, to my mind, argued against the idea that one of the three spiral arms between us and the galactic center was hosting an association that was blowing out along our line of sight. I didn't think that was at all likely. Anyway, the referee sort of you know, publish and perish, whatever, you know, sort of said, go ahead, whatever, you know. So there, I eventually got past the referee and got this stuff published. And for me, at least, I thought it was, it was fairly clear this was a galactic center phenomenon. But the, I do understand this problem that when you look at the, the, this stuff like the North Polar Spur, some of this stuff is thought to be, to be very local. So you can see why the idea of looking through the golden arches to the galactic center might, you might be forgiven for thinking that that might, might be local as well. So in fact, his, this is the soft X-ray emission, diffuse X-ray emission. You can see that this structure does not probe into the center like the hard did on both sides. Uh, here's the hard X-ray uh, um, diffuse emission again. And it's a blow up of this central region. And it's a blow up of that very central region. And you see this beautiful mid-infrared structure. This is the first outflow structure seen in the mid-infrared on galactic scales that we published. In fact, this was uh, Martin Cohen's contribution to give me access to the MX, uh, MSX mid-infrared data. Um, so, uh, so this basic, this is not uncommon, by the way. In the annual reviews 2005, we give a number of examples of starburst and AGN winds where you see an inner structure and an outer structure. NGC 3079 is a great example. You sort of see beautiful bipolar bubbles on scales of a few hundred parsecs, and you see an enormous bipolar structure on scales of 10 to 15 kiloparsecs. So this is not uncommon, presumably because these things have mass ejections, sort of stochastic or whatever ejections. And at the last line of my paper, 2003, was the following. Very energetic winds may be common to all galaxies, but very difficult to detect. I wish I'd had the nous to think about looking for the gamma ray counterpart. I'd never even crossed my mind. 
So it's a tremendous result to see uh, our colleagues here at Harvard uh, detect this stuff. Okay, so you know well about this. I don't have to spend too much time on it. The Fermi bubbles are now a very famous, famous result. Discovery paper 2010 by colleagues. I know that uh, two of them are at MIT, and of course Doug is here. And they won the Rossi Prize, uh, and I was lucky to be there in uh, January at, at AAS Seattle for the discovery in the gamma rays of the unanticipated Fermi bubbles. And I think this is entirely correct. I don't think anyone had foreseen this, this sort of phenomenon, at least on these sorts of galactic scales. And this is the 1 to 3, 3 to 10, and 10 to 500 GeV signature. And they've got two different ways of subtracting off the background to, to, to bring out these bubbles. The point I want to make, which I don't think was clear to some people, uh, early on, I mean people that had begun working and modeling on this, is the X-ray structure is no different. If you take this, shove it in Atoff coordinates, it's true that if you put it in Cartesians, this structure misses the bubbles. But if you put it into Atoffs and superimpose it, it does a beautiful job of filling in the underside of both bubbles. In fact, there's structure in here that you can see connects beautifully to the uh, X-rays on the, on the southern side. But it's not as clear unless you put it into the Atoff projection. So I'll just borrow a couple of images from Doug and his team. Um, at you, one thing that they make very nice, very clear is that this structure, whatever it is, is very sharp-edged. It's nice contrast from background into the bubbles. And the other thing, of course, which is really quite beautiful, quite extraordinary, which I think has been confirmed by subsequent workers, is the bubble spectrum goes from 1 to 100 GeV. It's very, very flat. I was just with um, Bill Matthews recently. And he agrees that this is a very difficult thing to really get right. Like, why should it be so hard? Whereas diffuse gamma ray emission is plunging by about 10 uh, GeV. So it really is a new phenomenon, some very, very hard gamma ray structure, very sharp-edged. Um, so it's, to me, when you think of high-energy processes, you often think of them as diffusing past the boundary, so boundaries get washed out. So the very fact this is so sharp-edged suggests some kind of trapping. So possible origins. OK, so the sorts of origins that people have posited, the first one is um, hadronic cosmic ray protons that collide with thermal nuclei, producing uh, neutral pions. Of course, these decay into gamma rays. Um, I have a hard time with this model. I've never understood any of uh, the talks in this field. It's nice work, and they present their work very, very well. Because for me, they're saying these, these, these structures, I mean, some of the early papers were saying they were a giga year old. And more recently, more like 300 mega years, because they need the time scale to get the uh, protons uh, out there. I don't believe it, because I've never seen structures that live above and below a galactic plane that's more than 10 million years old. Our annual reviews go through sorts of time scales for outflow structures and galaxies. They're never longer than 10 million years, maybe 20 if you're lucky. Nothing on the scale of hundreds of millions of years to billions of years. Not, I've never seen that. So the other model, uh, which I find much more appealing, although the hardness of the gamma ray emission is somewhat difficult still, is the, uh, which I think is the point that these people make who work on uh, the, uh, the hadronic ideas, is the leptonic idea. Now you've got cosmic ray electrons, inverse Compton scattering off various CMB or instellar radiation fuel backgrounds. These can produce gamma rays. And now you've got to get the cosmic ray electrons out there quickly. So you need a fast-flowing wind, which is fine, because the winds in galaxies are sort of 10,000 kilometers per second. We've known that for a long time. So the time scale now is measured in mega years um, to get enough of these uh, uh, cosmic ray electrons out to where all the gamma ray emission uh, is happening. The third idea, and this is, a, this is, to, this is to pinch uh, Doug over here, is what I call gin and tonic. Uh, we've had hadronic, leptonic, and gin and tonic, and this is dark matter annihilation. So I don't know what to make of that, other than to say that there are people who publish very well-cited papers, including Doug, uh, in FizRev letters, and, uh, and another, another very highly cited paper on Astro PH that didn't get published, but very nice work. But I, 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 would, I, I would argue, even though physicists love you for it, uh, that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So, um, and there's a comment at the bottom, um, I'll eat my words if anyone can make a stronger case for dark matter annihilation in the years ahead. If I'm wrong, I apologize. So um, gamma ray bubbles, these are sharp edge cosmic rays trapped, presumably by turbulent magnetic fields as they advect in this expanding thermal wind bubble. So it's some sort of sharp edgedness due to trapping by, by field lines. OK. So in fact, if you go, one of the things you learn nowadays, of course, Ken Freeman always reminds me, is that 
the things that we knew about get forgotten or ideas get regurgitated every 10 years and the person speaking has no notion of what happened 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I'm sure you've all seen that num numerous times. It must drive you mad. It drives Ken Freeman mad. So uh, I've actually formed a love for the history of astronomy. I've actually written about it with various people looking back through the literature. And it is embarrassing how many wonderful results we claim are new are in fact very well known from previous years. So um, further evidence for the wind, old and new. Well, Jay Lockman is one of those people who deserves credit. This is back in uh, 1984. And what he showed, the data I'm showing here, by the way, are Naomi's data with Jay in 2013. But he showed from much less data that the central, this is a galactic center over here, GC, and there are these big cavities where detect, the H1 is almost uh, undetected on both sides. So he made the point very early on, saying, look, you know, people like Joel Bregman like the idea of bulges driving, driving winds, and Ed Salpeter had made similar comments. So he said, you know, it could be a wind that blows all of this out. Now, as I've pointed out to Jay on a number of occasions, you, know, you can do that with purely with ionization. You can just basically ionize the stuff away, uh, which, of course, then means there should be some kind of recombination signal in these regions. And it's actually quite hard to say yay or nay whether that's true. But anyway, it's a beautiful result that the H1 appears to be swept out, which is also interesting because it means if it is swept out, the radiation is getting out from the center and propagating a great distance, as you know happens quite a lot with, uh, with AGNs. A second side of this, I won't have much time to mention these results, just, just one of the new, latest results, is the idea of using um, quasar stars. And in fact, not just quasar stars, also halo stars. Uh, using uh, especially stars that have like blue, blue horizontal branch stars that are fairly fairly featureless, so you go off and use them at, at some great distance as background probes, and you probe all the absorption lines out to you. And that stars are better than quasars in this respect because you can get a distance to the star, and you know how deep you're going with your absorption lines. So a lot of work going on here. There's already been a number of papers along the stream uh, and through the Fermi bubbles. I'll show some pictures later about this. Um, and in fact, here's one of those nice plots. This is by uh, Rongman Bordeloy. He's got a paper coming out next year. Uh, Andrew already has a paper, and there have been papers uh, last year as well. So what you see here are various sight lines through the bubbles. Uh, and there are detections pretty much, there were detections everywhere, I should say. And he, these are from halo stars. Some of these are from quasars. And these are from halo stars looking through down towards the bulge region. And you always find in all of these ions, from ionization states, a few EVs up to 100 EV, you always find multiple components. Um, and uh, we have a big team and, and a lot of, with a lot of experience, like um, Blair Savage, um, and uh, forgetting some names now. Um, and they, they're very experienced at looking at absorption line structures. And they're able to paint a picture of ionization kinematics, ionization and ionization kinematics as you go off through the bubbles. And you clearly detect the presence of highly ionized gas in these bubbles, somewhere in the shells, I presume, being driven uh, by this process. So there really is some expanding and trained material in addition to the gamma ray and X-ray emission. So I'll mention more about this as we, as we go along. So what about AGN versus starburst? This is always a problem, always difficult. Part of that reason, at the low power extreme of AGNs, is that SAFERTs invariably have starburst nuclei. Uh, this is a nice uh, review by Hotter and Sakai, and they show that half of all SAFERTs uh, have star formation. I know that Pepe, Fabiano, and colleagues have made similar comments for years. So it's uh, one of these things that you're always dealing with. You're always fighting. Uh, it's looking for the AGN and, and trying to distinguish it, separate it out from, from the star formation around it. But if you read my paper and the, and the very long appendices to that paper, you'll quickly realize that star formation really doesn't do anything for you in terms of UV output on these scales, not even close. But we'll come back to that as well. So if you blow up this central region, this is where Sag A is, and Sag A star, which is the radiative counterpart of the black hole, in here. And this is stuff you'll recognize from the wonderful uh, CFA-driven uh, Chandra stuff. Uh, if you blow that up, there's um, been a lot of work about um, cold clouds, molecular clouds, dense H1 clouds, Different epochs, November 2004, April 2007, March 2008, April 2009. And here are various papers, starting with Sunyaev and the Granite uh, experiment, going all the way through ASCA, Chandra, Integral, XMM, and others. And what you find is that there's a scintillation effect going on. Individual clouds are reflecting very hard X-rays at different times, sort of like looking at the speckle of a star, a defocused star, if you've ever seen that before. 
Um, and and this, is, this is not a weak effect. This is very strong. These are the, 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 I think this is from, from Pontius' review, I think. And you see that these detections are sort of 13 sigma, uh, very, very strong detections right through this region. Uh, and on, and, and what, I, what you're seeing here has a light crossing time of something like 40 or 50 light years. So you're seeing time scales up to 100 years at least, and they make arguments for, for longer in the recent review by, by Ponti. So there's an awful lot of flickering going on, some very, very powerful phenomenon, uh, which I think is, is, is almost certainly to do with Sag A star rather than local sources. So, uh, and there are other beautiful uh, results that have been presented. There's a website where you can look at the events that happen uh, almost on a weekly basis. And in fact, this paper by NOAC concludes that there is a flare uh, essentially every day uh, of the year. You'll find evidence for a flare from Sag A star. Uh, I think this is in, in X, yeah, from Chandra, from, from X-rays. There's an infrared light curve that you can see from Witzel's paper. This is, uh, uh, I think, sorry, this is in minutes. So this is like uh, 20 days, three weeks from end to end. And I'm sure you've seen the Kepler results. Someone was showing me, Paul Green was showing me the Kepler results towards nearby safe. It's this beautiful flickering behavior that's now widely established. OK, so let me now switch gears and take you to this very interesting phenomenon of the Magellanic Stream mystery. This is gas that trails behind the LMC and the SMC. Um, here's the LMC, here's the SMC. And this is, these are degrees of Magellanic longitude. So you follow the great circle through these, the, from Magellan, from LMC, uh, through the South Galactic Pole. And just remember these for the moment. You can think of it as 363, 3300, or you can think of it as 0, minus 30, minus 60. I think the plots that I show do it either way. The point is that's, that the minus 60 is about the South Galactic Pole and all the way over, to, uh, way over. And in fact, um, there's evidence the gas keeps on going. It goes more than half the sky round. And here are the leading arms, which are rather messy looking things, but they're, they're very real. The new maps coming out are very impressive. So this is the Magellanic Stream with the LMC and the SMC removed. The South Galactic Pole now is where that star is at uh, sort of 303 degrees. In Mag this is the long, the great circle going through the LMC. Um, and now uh, what you see, wherever you see a red circle, that's where H-alpha emission has been detected. Wherever you see a blue circle is essentially a non-detection, at some threshold, uh, which is 10 milli Rayleigh's in the WAM speak. Well, I'll mention that in a moment. That's very faint. That's still down at the 10 to the minus 19 ergs per cm squared per second kind of level, lower than that, in 10 to the minus 20 ergs per cm squared per second. So it's very, very faint. The way they do that is they get an interferogram, a fabry perot ring. They stare at a patch of cloud. In a very narrow band, you're dispersing radially at maybe only 10 angstroms. And you bin up maybe you know, 2,000 by 2,000, 4,000 by 4,000 pixels. You get millions of pixels per angstrom. You bin it up azimuthally, and you get one little spectrum, which is azimuthally binned for that entire region. And they go very, very faint as a consequence. So these detections are at a level of about sort of 100 to 200 milli Rayleigh's. So these will be very, very faint night skylines in your deepest spectroscopic data. To prove to you that really is uh, coming from H1 in the stream, this is the H alpha velocity measured against the H1 velocity. And the relationship, as you can see, is very, very good. By the way, the H alpha is unresolved at about 20, 20 kilometers per second. So it's static. It's static ionization. It's being hit by something. Some, you know, to, to get the whole stream lit up, you're hitting it with an, uh, um, an ionization, with some sort of source of ionization over at least 60 degrees along the stream. So the next thing to show you, just for the moment, uh, is the measurements in now. These units are annoying. They were invented by atmospheric physicists like Chamberlain. Awesome uh, paper, actually, when you read it. Uh, it's the only unit I know of which is purely a measure of photons. It's 10 to the 6 over 4 pi photons per cm squared per second. It's a bizarre unit. And 330 milli Rayleigh's is an emission measure of 1, if you'd like to think in you know, X-ray people, you know, N-E squared L. Uh, and that maps to people who do optical infrared spectroscopy to 2 to the minus 18 ergs per cm squared per second per arc second. So these detections are down at the level of, uh, in fact, it's quite bright. You can get down to 10 to the minus 20, but in fact, these are at the level of about 10 to the minus 18 or fainter. The really important point is that all these detections, mostly by WAM, are much too high to explain in terms of the galactic radiation field. The, the model that I published was a factor of two lower than that, in fact, was sort of below here somewhere. But Chris McKee in a paper made a very solid point that, in fact, you need to account for 
what he called decaying uh, sort of um, X-ray bubbles. There's, there's other sources of UV that I hadn't even heard of, like supernova remnants where the X-ray, where the stuff is cooling. So when you put that in, that might get you up by a factor of two altogether. But still, you're down by a factor of, let's say, four below what you need to explain the ionization along the stream. This is not due to the galactic ultraviolet radiation field. And there's a lot of work on the escape fractions, about 6% off the, off the disk. I think uh, there are so many ways in which you can measure that now off high-velocity clouds and so forth. So anyway, um, in fact, there are, there's one spot on the cloud which is very, very strong. It's up around sort of 700 millirelis in, in one particular cloudlet on the stream. Uh, which is really, really quite, quite extraordinary. Okay, just to take you through a couple of models to show what you're up against when you try to explain this emission. This is the, uh, the UV model for the galaxy that was first published by Phil, Lo Phil Maloney and myself back in uh, sort of around 2000. What I'm showing you here is the soft and the hard radiation field. The soft is the blue, is the, is the red uh, contours. And that number is log, uh, uh, log of the flux. That's, that's 10 to the 7 photons per cm squared per second. So all of my calculations and plots and data are now in photons, which is a, a nice, neat measure to, to work in. So the ionizing photons per cm squared per second are lower by a factor of almost 100, 60 or 70. So 10 to the 5 photons per cm squared per second, and that's 50 kiloparsecs. So that's way below what you need to account for the emission measure, and this goes out to 100 uh, kiloparsecs. We even include things like the LMC and the SMC and so on. The black lines, by the way, are quasar sight lines. We actually use these sight lines to calibrate some of the, the HST cost ionization modeling. So the important number here, by the way, is this number in front. You can forget the rest of it. This factor here is a factor of two for Chris McKee. So that's actually 40 millirelis. It's about as good as you'll ever get from the, uh, the UV field, from the, the UV intensity from the galaxy. Now, the thing to be aware of is this is all predicated on the idea that the stream sits at 55 kiloparsecs, which is almost certainly not true now. I'll get to that in a moment. In fact, the stream must be much further, and there are many teams like Gatina Besler. I think she's uh, one of your wonderful products, uh, and she has done lots of modeling, and there are many other groups besides, and they all get much further out now because the LMC and the SMC, it's actually it was uh, Nita Kalavaya-Leal's work beautiful work where she showed the proper motion of the LMC and the SMC was much faster than we thought, like 40% higher. And the halo mass uh, is, is lower than we thought, and I think that's now looking very, very strong. And therefore, the orbit must be highly elliptic, and the stream must push out to at least 75, maybe even 100 kiloparsecs. So therefore, this gets much even harder to do. An alternative approach, I know that many of you at the CFA over the years have written lots of papers about extended narrowline regions in galaxies. Well, of course, you know about Seyfert's. In Seyfert's, this is a, a beautiful S0 that was first published. I think it was this paper by Tad Hunter and Svetanov that highlighted how spectacular this can be. They see ionized gas uh, in sort of biconic structures along some random axis with respect to the, uh, the S0. And this has been driven by a Seyfert nucleus. And they end up with some tilt angle, which is large. They end up with some opening angle, which is about 50 degrees. And they see ionized gas as far as 35 uh, kiloparsecs. There's lots of these now in the literature, many, many of them. Kramer and VR went one better. They have a uh, sort of a, a safer one, uh, possibly even a soft, I can't even remember. I think it was a safer one. And they claim to see ionization cones out to 90 kiloparsecs in one of their sources. So AGNs clearly can light up, at least in the flash, can light up a very, very long radial extent. OK, so this is the model I want to explore, and I want to show you uh, what evidence is beginning to emerge from, uh, from other fields in a moment. OK, so this is a, just a very simple drawing. I couldn't even tell you what the open angle is right now, what even the tilt angle might be. just want to give you a sort of a generic cartoon. And the stream, the real problem here is the stream's distance. We always use the mean distance of the LMC and the SMC, which is 55 kiloparsecs. LMC is 50, SMC is 60. We use the mean distance to define this orbit, and we get this distance. Uh, which is about 55, uh, which is almost certainly wrong. The numbering here, MS12345, this is the numbering the radio astronomers uh, used when they first discovered it in, in the 70s. So, and as I said before, the stream's distance is uncertain, but it's certainly, it, it almost certainly is further than 70 and could even be as high as 100. In fact, some of uh, Gertina's models and other models by a student of mine put it possibly even at 120. So here's a question. The sky is covered with high-velocity clouds. So why the stream? 
why not use the high-velocity clouds to, to verify that this is true, that there really is some kind of enormous explosion, outflow, whatever, from the center? The problem is, as Josh Peak points out, sorry, his name's off the bottom here, this is Josh Peak. He has a rather nice um, summary of where high-velocity clouds are. So what I've now done is fold both hemispheres, and I've folded 100, uh, 360 degrees. And, and all these famous high-velocity clouds, as Chris McKee always points out, the, cloud, the sky is covered in clouds. You really, there's no room to swing a cat here at all. You know, you've, got a, you've got like 40, 50% coverage down to a column of 10 to the 19. Down to 10 to the 18, it's even more. But if you ask, where is this stuff? This stuff is all at low latitude. Here's the stream, of course, but everything else you see here is at low galactic latitude. It's all below 30. The only cloud that gets a little bit above it is cloud C, complex C. And I don't even know what the orientation of that is. I know it's very large, like 10 kiloparsecs in length, maybe. It's a very big structure. So I don't know if any of that actually gets you into these cones or not. So about half the volume above and below the uh, galactic center is free of this dense gas, which is consistent with what Lockman has been saying for a long time. Now, the black hole uh, is very well known in terms of mass now, 4.2, 10 to the 6 uh, to 10 percent. Um, and that black hole didn't just appear out of nothing. I presume it's the oldest thing in the entire galaxy. It was seeded, one presumes, by one of the first stars. These first star progenitors leave behind a black hole remnant. That's what's thought. Uh, and it's built up over the course of time by absorbing uh, stuff over billions of years. To get you to that black hole, you had to expend something like 10 to the 60 ergs of energy into the cosmos. So that had to have happened at some point. Presumably, much of it happened in the, in the early universe. Today, to get to an Eddington luminosity, which of course is we're far below that. This, this, so an Eddington luminosity, you need that 0.2 solar masses per year. Today, it's 10 to the minus 8. And this is something that uh, 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 Professor Narayan knows much more about than me, but uh, it's an extraordinary thing that you have so much gas around the galactic center and so little activity today. And this is my point, that presumably in the recent past, there was a lot more activity than we see at, at the present time. An AGN model gets a lot easier uh, and much more interesting. And I'll show you the, what happens in, in a flash in terms of time dependence in a moment. So um, I took one of the safe foots that was done. Was this, this, this spectrum uh, was from 10, NGC 1068. It was reconstructed from uh, the ISO spectrum. ISO went from 2 to 200 microns. It had zillions of fine structure lines and recombination lines. And they were able to reconstruct the continuum, even though you couldn't see the continuum in this safe foot too. And you see this beautiful uh, big blue bump and this power law. I don't know if that work is still believed, but it was believed at the time. So I basically put together a model in that paper where we have a big blue bump. You can actually adjust the height of this big blue bump with respect to this, this continuum. This is what it looks like uh, uh, in photons. Now, what you have to look at now is this number, 825. I'm taking a beam factor of 1. I'm not going to bother with exotic models at all today. Um, the Eddington luminosity, we've got that around 10% um, uh, for the moment. The escape fraction, to be consistent with John McCahey's work, is about probably 100%, that when he needs essentially all the inferred emission along his uh, axis, and you could make that lower, 50 or 30%, if you didn't believe that. And the distance, uh, scaled to 55 kiloparsecs, presumably it's much further out, but that gets you in the flash up to 800 millirelis, which is a factor of 20 higher, uh, than what you uh, get with the galactic model. Now, when you do this with type dependence, it's very interesting uh, what happens. First thing to say is that there's not, much in dense, there's not much range in density you can work with for the stream. You've got to explain the spin flip transition, how much you, H1 you have in your column and the geometry of it and the size. You also have to explain the recombination emission. You need enough recombination emission to explain what you observe. What that gives you is a range of density between 0.01 0.03, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, and 1. You've basically got three densities to choose from. So depending on which density you want in your flash, in the flash at 800 milli Rayleigh's, it drives you up to a very high temperature very, very quickly. I should say, by the way, this is at 0.1 solar metallicity. Uh, there's been a lot of work by the HST cost team along the stream, and everywhere along the stream, to, with relatively small scatter, they find the metallicity is 10% is solar. Except as you get near the, uh, the LNC, the metallicity starts to go up. But anywhere else along the stream, it really rock solid. It's always at 0.1, uh, which is quite a remarkable result. I thought there would at least be some variation because of how it got stripped, but it doesn't seem to be the case. So, so even at very low metallicity, what you get is the temperature gets shot up very quickly. 
and it begins to cool uh, rather, uh, rather slowly. This is your 1 over density limit over here. Now, compare that to recombination. I always treated recombination as cooling, but it's not true. The recombination is faster. The cooling is slower, at least at, at this metallicity. And the recombination happens uh, quite quickly. You go through 50% on time scales of between 100,000 and, and 10 million years. Uh, I think I've also said that, the, um, that this, is, um, this is available now. This is this mapping for uh, code. Now, distance matters because of how much time you have to get to your signal that you observe. The background signal along the stream, for the most part, is about 160 uh, uh, milliradians here. So you have to get to 160 milliradians somehow. So clearly what happens is you have a flash, and after the flash it fades uh, by a combination of recombination uh, and cooling. So if the stream is at 55 kiloparsecs, you've got a lot more time and a lot more oomph, as it were, to get you anywhere you like down to this level. So you've got uh, a long lead-up time uh, till you get to this point. If you take the stream further away, 100 kiloparsecs, you've got less time, but you can just do it. You still can get to the point where you can explain this background along, along the stream, assuming that you're in this fading regime. So if I put that on top of the points, uh, so you have 55 kiloparsecs, uh, you get this enormous flash up here, and the stuff fades, comes down. 100 kiloparsecs is dangerously close uh, to, to this line, this background line. So what you have now is a flash followed by uh, fading recombination uh, emission. So you can do it. One thing to be aware of is the ionization states that you observe is different depending on where you are. In the flash, you can generate strong O3 emission, strong helium-2 emission, uh, and there's none of that is detected by WAM. So we're not in the flash. So we're not in, in, this, in these models, you aren't, you aren't at the position of the asterisk. And then as it basically cools down, you begin to pick up these ionization lines. So interesting st stuff uh, begins to happen. This, by the way, is assuming it's an Eddington of 10%. If you make it 30%, then you can save yourself a factor of three uh, on this figure. OK, so now some recent evidence uh, for hard ionization along the stream right over the South Galactic Pole. So I might just mention once again, because I'm at Harvard, uh, is that um, Gatine has been doing wonderful work motivated by Nietzsche's work on the proper motions. Uh, and and I, I, mean, I really do mean there's, there's at least a dozen teams working on this. I have a group as well that's been doing work on this. Uh, and we all get the same result that basically, in fact, the leading arm is a really strong constraint on how the LMC and SMC interact. These, these are like sort of dancers that dance together and they spiral around the Milky Way. There's a lot of work going into this. Primarily because you really need to get this right before you start believing models of external galaxies. I mean, you really want to understand how this, how this works, how it operates. And these are tidal features going over the South Galactic Pole. So I think most people would tell you today, and I heard James Binney give a review talk of what they were doing, saying the stream could not be closer than about 70 kiloparsecs. Now, if you go along the stream and have a look at these S2, S3, S4 absorption signatures, this is all much later now. This is 2014, 2015. Um, the LMC is here. And red, green, blue means hard ionization, intermediate, and soft. So these ions, I mean, it's something like 40 EV down to 10 EV. It's, it's, I can't remember the exact numbers. But so basically, you're comparing S4 to S2. So basically, you have these three ionization states. And you get hard ionization right on top of the LMC when you're in amongst the LMC, is, is what here. But then between that and over the South Galactic Poles, it goes soft again. It's soft way out here. Uh, and then right over the poles, you've only got uh, five, six bin sight lines. But you can see the ionization is very hard right over the South Galactic Pole, which is really interesting. Uh, clearly, as, as you always hear in talks, you need more data. And there's, there are plans afoot to, I think this is of order 70 quasar uh, and, uh, and yeah, of order 70 quasar sight lines, I think I'm right in saying, to get this amount of data. So, so more need to be observed to fill it out in more detail and also to look further along the stream. There's more stuff to be had along here in leading arms. And there's more stuff to be had over here to see if it really is a hard ionization effect, effect over the poles. So let's have a look about the burst time. If you really believe this notion that the stream has been lit up by something quite extraordinary, that, uh, that something at the galactic center has gone bang, and the radiation has propagated outwards, it's hit the stream, and we're seeing this for the first time, uh, it's sort of fading. Um, what can we say about when this happened? And is there support from other, other fields? I just want to say that when I went looking for models of accretion disks that drive winds, 
accretion disk models, they either explain the radiation field or they explain the wind. It's very, very difficult to get anyone to explain the radiation field and the wind at the same time, at least in the ultraviolet and X-rays. So I've talked to you know, a lot of different teams. I've emailed, like Proger and Kalman. I had emails with uh, Novak and uh, Chiotta and Ostriker, uh, with, with uh, Phil Hopkins, endless groups. Wonderful work, but people were very, very noncommittal about whether you can associate an explosion with the UV soft X-ray output. Anyway, here are the timescales. So you need a bunch of timescales. So consider a flare that took place in the past, and it occurred for a burst time of T uh, b. Well, the first, the obvious one you have is the crossing time. You've got to have the radiation go out to the stream. It's got to ionize the stream, and then you have to have the recombination signal come back. So you have this double crossing time, and that looks like 200,000 years uh, multiplied by the distance. So if it's a 55 kiloparsecs, if it was 100 kiloparsecs, this goes off to, of course, goes off to like three or four uh, hundred thousand years. Then you have the photonization time. Now, this is essentially relates to the ionization parameter, because basically the radiation field has to eat its way into the gas before it reaches equilibrium. It hits the front of the gas, it ionizes its way in, and at some point, like H2 region physics, it sort of stabilizes, and you have this sort of net, vo this net volume of recombining gas. And that's very quick. It's of order four, uh, 4,000 years multiplied by the photon flux to the power of 10 to the 6, 5 sub 6. Then you have the recombination time. This is the one that depends on density. So basically 100,000 years divided by the density of your cloud. And remember that you're really only allowed something between 0.01 and 1. Um, and it probably even, I would have said, in terms of the emission measure, it probably is sort of less than 1, like 0.3 or below that even. So you, what you end up with, by the way, from very simple arguments, is the minimum energy to get any of this to happen for you is of order 10 to the 56 ergs. And the minimum mass to get this flash occurring, I'm not saying on what time scale for the moment, but the minimum mass, because of the efficiency of accretion, is of order 4,000 uh, solar, solar masses. So it's unlikely to be 4,000 stars, because these happen every 40,000 years or so. I mean, it's like, it's, it, you imagine it's a gas cloud uh, that's doing this kind of thing, a small gas cloud. So here are the results. Uh, look at the last column before I go back to new observations and models and so forth. Um, and the last column here, this is a uh, density of 1 down to density of 0.03. Uh, this is density of, uh, of 1 down to density of 0 0.01. I'm not quite sure there's numbers there. Anyway, you get, get 500,000 years, 800,000 years, 2 million years, 3 million years, 5 million years. And you get similar numbers, interestingly, for the, for the more distant model. 700,000 years up to a million years, 2 million years, 5 million years. Um, and we try to do this, all this sort of Bayesian stuff that one does these days, sort of uh, you know, marginalizing over different model parameters. And we decided that it had to be somewhere in the range of 800,000 years to 3 million years was the most likely time scale for this. One more thing um, is the time scale is of order a few million years. It could be as much as 5 million. It could be in that range. But the burst time, unfortunately, we can't say much about. Uh, we're not sensitive to burst time because of the inhomogeneity of the stream and differences in density. And, and in fact, I have a whole appendix in three pages to, to, to explain, because the referee was keen to know why or why not. And we really can't say more than it has to be more than 4,000 years, which was the time scale to ionize enough gas to give you a strong enough signal. So what about competing models? Well, embarrassingly, the only competing model that exists is the one I did for the stream uh, coming into the uh, halo and breaking up through a very different process. This is what Mike Schull in an email called Bugs on a Windscreen Model. I call it the shock cascade. And the idea here is that the, HV, the high velocity cloud, the stream gas comes into the hot halo. And the trouble is that as soon as the first cloud hits the hot halo, basically all the detritus and junk that comes off the cloud gets left behind. And so the stuff coming in behind runs into the, to the junk of the stuff ahead of it. Uh, and that works rather, rather well uh, if, as long as the stream is very close, like you're in the dense part of the hot halo. If you put the stream further away, it's a problem. Uh, and that's something we've addressed in a recent paper with Torsten Tepper Garcia, who just joined me as a postdoc from Joop Shire's group in uh, Leiden. And he's been doing nice work on, on doing this. He's also been doing this with MHD, trying to understand the effect of fields as well. So I'll just run that for a moment and show you what that looks like, see if that works. Um, sorry, I've just lost it. There we are. Oh, that's, not, that's annoying. Why is that not running? Oh, oh dear. I'm sorry. I wanted to show you what that looks like. Basically. Uh, basically, the, the emission propagates along the shock, the, uh, along the, the gas. The important point to make, though, is that this is a slow shock. 
If you just run that cloud at 300 kilometers a second into hot gas, it does nothing for you. The density contrast is, it just doesn't give you strong shock. What you need is dense gas being hit by dense gas to get you up to these uh, emissions, and then, and then you basically are in the slow shock uh, regime. And what that does for you, uh, because of the Boltzmann factor, you know that when you're in the slow shock domain, um, you know, uh, uh, basically, it, when your energy levels of N equals 2, 3, 4, at the, high, the, high, the higher energy levels, these basically, um, basically become overpopulated through the Boltzmann factor with respect to uh, H beta. And basically, you end up with this recombination coefficient that looks stronger. This is a, this is a result, I should say, from, from Schull and McKee's uh, 1979 paper, which is interesting because there's no dust to speak of in the stream. It wouldn't do you anything like absorb H. So this, this ratio you normally muck around with through the presence of dust. So without dust, we would predict that the Bolmer decrement would be a larger number than three. Most of this stuff would be up around uh, three and a half, four, uh, or even five. So that's a prediction for, the, for WAM to go after uh, in Chile, which is uh, hopefully it'll do quite soon. So the other uh, model I've already mentioned is the safe at flare model. And you cannot get away from a Bolmer decrement of three. You just, just can't do it. If you're going to hit it with any kind of radiation field from the galactic center, uh, and you wouldn't see uh, the, these hard ions uh, unless you were right on the flash when it first happened. But for most of the lifetime of the flash, you wouldn't see much in the way of hard ionization. So what can we say about the galaxy? Well, it turns out that there are a lot of nearby galaxies that have, no, well, not Fermi bubbles, because that's gamma ray emission, but have radio bubbles, like FR1, sort of low luminosity type structures. There are many of them. I think I counted more than 30 well known. And here's a particularly spectacular example in radio continuum from, from Bill Keel. This is a nearby uh, Seyfert as well. And there's a lot of objects that have these beautiful biconics sort of radio structures. And I just, I've always imagined that what we're seeing is sort of an early phase of what you see uh, in, in, these, in these nearby Seyferts. There's another one I saw recently in Astro PH. I thought I'd just dump it in here. Uh, this is by Mao. Do I, do I have that uh, reference on here? Yeah, here, Mao 2015. This is another one of these nearby spirals, and it has these beautiful uh, radio lobe looking things coming out from it. So I rather imagine the Fermi bubbles is somehow related to this kind of, this kind of process. So what can we say about the presence of a jet, or do we even need a jet? So when I gave a talk at Columbia, Jerry Ostreicher asked the question, well, if it's going to be a low-powered safer, the jet can be coming off at any angle, and therefore, why are the bubbles going off uh, north-south, or even, or even, even close to north-south? They could be at some small tilt, like in galactic winds can be tilted by tens of degrees. And I think the point is that you see in these models, jet models that break out into inhomogeneous re gas region, density region, the, 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 the energy of the jet just gets di di uh, di um, diffracted or, or dispersed into the local volume, and that local volume just pumps up. And then that, once you're in bubble dynamics, the bubble just takes off along the line of least resistance. So I don't think the jet direction matters in terms of where these bubbles are going. And that's something that's been seen now in rather beautiful models of, of the Fermi bubbles. Is there evidence for a jet? I mean, all the same, and would you need a jet, or is there evidence for a jet? Um, in fact, the, there are people that claim something, but you get like one sigma blobs on the other side of the nucleus. This is uh, from Bauer and Backer, I think. I can't remember now from the VLBA, and there's been something said in the x-rays. So it's very, very tenuous stuff. I don't think the evidence is at all strong for the presence of a jet. Uh, you might know better, Doug. You're willing to speak if you know better from new observations. Uh, in any event, I don't think the presence of a jet matters uh, necessarily. But there are lots of papers coming out about the presence of a jet and how jets blow bubbles. Uh, here's one such example. I like this paper by Guo and Matthews, 2012. They also presented at Stanford, and I was blown away by their numbers for energy and time scales because they look just like mine. So the dotted lines that you see here are the Fermi bubbles, so plus or minus 50 degrees or something. And what you see here is the cosmic ray energy density. Now, it looks rather frog-like, you know, complicated. This is one million years, two million years. But the point they make in their next paper is that when you add viscosity, it smooths this stuff out a lot. It looks much more like a bubble structure. So I'm just showing you their early results because it's the only one I have loaded. And this is the temperature uh, down here. And they're saying there'll be a sort of a shock precursor at very diffuse levels that you could possibly find. So I like that work for a number of reasons. I was quite stunned. Um, it, I know it's, I don't doubt it's fortuitous, because I had numbers like 0.7 or 0.8 to 2.6 or something. But basically, they got a time scale of 1 to 3 million years, uh, which is an awful lot like my time scale. And the energy range they were offering 
they said that their, their lower number of 555 was a concession to my paper because they thought maybe, you know, that, but I, I, in fact, they would argue now, as do many papers on this stuff, that in fact it's 1056, 10, 10 to 56, 57 ergs is much more, the high energy side of this is much more likely uh, to really get this stuff going, especially if you want to get the, uh, the hard part of the gamma ray, uh, gamma ray spectrum. Uh, and, the, and the other thing they say, which I am not sensitive to, is that this would have needed to have occurred for a burst time scale of 100,000 years up to about 500,000 years. So they would be saying that this thing turned off, whatever it was doing, it had a great time a few million years ago, uh, but it, it turned off uh, maybe possibly even within the last million years, who knows. So I, I, was, I was sort of gobsmacked by this, and in fact it was their talk that convinced me that we should write up what we were trying to, trying to, to do in terms of the, the much extreme idea of using that as a screen. Okay, let me finish up. I think I'm down to my, uh, I've lost the clock, where is it? Yeah, I'm, I'm down to my last little bit here. So let me say something about this. This is really very interesting. So the idea of AGN flickering over long time scales. So uh, as one does, you scratch around for models. You scratch around for some insight into how this might occur and what you might learn. Because if you think about it, what I'm saying is you've gone from 0.1 Eddington, possibly 0.3 Eddington, to 10 to the minus 8 Eddington in the space of two or three million years. That's a heck of a change. That's like a 70 or 80 dB change in activity. And I had no idea at that time whether that was possible. So the analogy, of course, is with earthquakes and volcanoes. If you hang around for a few years, you might get a rumble. If you hang around for 10 years, you might get a bad earthquake. If you hang around for 100 years, you'll get a devastating earthquake. So it's that kind of sort of one over F noise, sort of stochastic fl flickery noise behavior that one imagines must be right. So I had no idea if models were already available for this. So quite soon I came across this work by Novak, Ostriker, and Chiotti, and I knew Luca quite well, and was able to get hold of Novak's models before he disappeared into, into industry. Then I had the problem of decoding these long papers, 2011, 2012. It's very difficult to understand what's going on unless you read 20 years of Jerry Ostriker's research. And it's really, I mean, it's incredible how much he literally has been building up this machinery and this sort of way of thinking over a very long period of time. It's all about momentum-driven winds, switching to energy-driven winds. And, um, but what I've come to understand slowly but surely is what they are doing essentially is spherical accretion uh, without conservation for angular momentum. And they're, they're dropping it down onto a sort of a static black hole. That's important because essentially when it comes down, it can't be going out. It's either on or off. Um, and anyway, to cut a long story short, I'll come to, what, uh, to two insights that follow this. Uh, they don't see anything more than 50 dB variation in a million years. This is purely hydro. Uh, and by the way, this is their power spectrum. You, you, I've got this on disk. It's quite, quite great to look. This is 2 to 12 giga years. You're in the... Uh, this is the sort of five to six giga year blow up of that region, and you blow up this little patch of 100 million years, and you see, you see again this stochastic behavior all the way down, turtles all the way down. Um, so if you take the power spectrum of that, it's really interesting. Um, this is, you know, um, wave number along here, and you've got basically uh, frequency. You've got this is basically a million years here, 10 million years, 100 million years, a billion years. So it's rather flat. That's what you get from accretion in CDM along shells. It's sort of you know, so, uh, you don't really get um, um, uh, any kind of color to that stuff. But if you're below a million years, you get this really beautiful flicker, one over F noise, flicker noise. This is something I'm sure you're all very aware of from uh, other applied fields like, you know, transistors and, and so on. And I won't, I'd love to digress into droplets of water on hot plates and how it breaks up, but uh, it's not entirely the same as accretion onto black holes. Professor Narayan can correct me um, from a career on that. Um, but anyway, um, I was a little bit worried by that because I wasn't even sure what to make of these models and if there was any confirmation to be had from other models. So I came across this work by uh, Phil Hopkins. And he's done two things which I think are rather nice. He has a Shakura Sanyaya disk, so he now worries about accretion onto the disk. He brings in viscosity, so now he has angular momentum conservation, basically. And that means he can actually feed the accretion disk at the same time as the accretion disk reacts with the accretion. So he can have both of them going on at the same time. I thought that was rather nice. But what was rather dispiriting is that he gets timescales, which could be as little as a million years, but he says more reasonably, more like 10 million years. And his paper is actually very clear. He, he puts the whole story into one big paper. 
Um, and so what he sees, he says, is an awful lot like what they see here. They get sort of flickery behavior in this hierarchy on many, many scales in time, but it looks convolved by something which might be a million years or 10 million years long. And as far as I can tell from their plots, they are not getting variations much bigger than, say, 50 dB, although, I, to be honest with you, I haven't had a chance to troll through the data and look at that for myself. So let me just finish up by saying that I go to uh, Oxford a few times a year, and I get to have lunch with uh, Steve Balbus, uh, who is a very impressive individual who doesn't know a lot about these magnetized disks. And his comment to me was, I really need to be looking for models which are MHD oh, and reconnection driven, because there you have essentially field lines that, that basically the whole disk is threaded by field lines, your MRI instability, of course, which you need to generate this, this, this whole turbulent regime. And he, his point was that you need the field lines to feed stuff, to drip line stuff onto the disk. And in that way, he imagines that you can compress material in the, sort of in the MHD domain, and then you get these much, much bigger flashes and much shorter timescales. So he said he wouldn't be at all, he, he, his intuition was the flickering would be at least as stochastic as this, and possibly a lot more. Uh, so I now need to make contact with someone like Charles Gammy or whoever's, and I'm not sure how far down the track they are with their modeling, but, it, but he, his intuition was that MHD would do a lot more for us. And he said you should really be doing MHD anyway if you're working on accretion disks. So there's a lot of work going on. I, I had a, a, a slide I took out. It was too information heavy. But there are 25 projects I counted on the Galactic Center happening in the next 10 years. I mean, spectacular things like IceCube, which claims it will see uh, neutrinos from the hadronic process. And within 10 years, they'll, they'll be able to distinguish the bubbles because they can tell where the Galactic Center is. I thought it was an amazing concept, if that's true. Uh, and then you've got the whole Earth experiment. You've got this uh, uh, VLB, uh, yes, here we are, the network of radio telescopes, which is a wonderful experiment. You've got the gravity experiment doing micro arc second astrometry on Sanjay Star uh, with the VLTI, you know, connecting up all the VLTs. There are so many beautiful experiments uh, taking place. And I don't doubt that that future proofs uh, astrophysics for, for many, many years because of the complexity of, of, of black hole physics. So here's my punchline to finish. The wonderful thing about nuclear activity is we see it out to the highest redshifts, and what we have is a front row seat. And we observe flare-like behavior on a daily basis, and I would love to know more about how these flares occur. I know the models depend heavily on what happens in solar astrophysics, uh, some sort of coronal mass ejection, but I'm sure we'll get to the point of probing this stuff directly one day very soon. Um, the Im imprint of full-blown safe activity is visible across the stream. This is my position. Uh, but at the present time, it's very hard to explain this enormous variation in activity on a million year timescale. The stream itself, by the way, provides spatially independent views of the galactic center. Uh, and this is something that will be explored uh, by Andrew Fox, uh, Rogman Bordelot, MIT, uh, and others. And I'd, f I'd end up by saying that if all this stuff hangs together the way that you've seen from the hard x-rays and so forth, we're talking about AGM bursts that are frequent, they're short and they're sharp, and stochastic and possibly even flicker noise behavior. Uh, and basically, what we're looking for is something which explains an event like this, which looks an awful lot like the Fermi bubbles. Thank you very much. Questions? So, uh, Rudy. Is the ring seen on the Sophia forecast images as the kind of a star cluster ring around Sagittarius A star? Is that coplanar with the North Polar ring that you've been describing? Sorry, which ring is this? I'm not sure what you mean by a ring. On the Sagittarius A star, high resolution images taken by the 747 flying Sophia telescope. Yeah. There is Sagittarius A star that sort of. Uh, There's some rings around it. Out there. It has a ring full of stellar, resolved stellar like things, and it is in a plane inclined to the ecliptic, rather like a polar ring. So I was wondering if that's on the same plane, the cold polar plane, and understood I as mean, the inner edge of the accretion disk that you're talking about. It's a great idea, and I have no idea. I've not even seen this. This is something I haven't seen. I'm aware of people doing work on resolved clusters and people talking about one or two planes. Palmar, I remember one paper I saw, but I haven't looked at this stuff at all. Thank you. In fact, the time scale for that, when did that happen? Is that a longer time scale? I don't know. Also, it's the issue of when they formed. It's a very interesting thought. So you've been nice results about how this is really consistent with AGN activity, but I was hoping you could come back and talk about um, starburst activity. Yeah. This is also a good reason to believe that this could be from starburst. So the Galactic Center has a lot, a lot of dense gas and not a whole lot of star formation, but there's good evidence that it did have star formation in the past. Um, 
So, so is any of this like better information than Starburst? What would you want to explain though with Starburst activity? I mean, because we have a very, very we have very well defined star formation history over the last hundred million years because individual stars are resolved and each of the star clusters have a lot of work on them. There are like 20 papers on arches and 50 papers on each cluster. They know a lot about the star formation history. So actually in my paper, one of the appendices, I reconstruct the star formation history and show energetically it's not that impressive in terms of the starbursts that you see in other galaxies. Not for radiation. Do you mean in terms of the bubbles themselves? Or? The bubbles themselves, and also there could be stars that are missing because uh, you can't you can't look through the extinction to see them. Yeah, I, yeah. So, so, yeah, I have a real. I'm not sure which part of the Fermi bubble. It's it's hard to answer that without being uh, getting personal about some of this this work on the hadronic uh, process. <laughs> um, they need long time scales. If you're on about starburst driving, getting enough of these uh, massive particles out to the bubbles. If you, if you mean in terms of the, the leptons, it, it's possible. I just think the, the AGN makes a stronger case. You're right. A, a starburst-driven wind is also 10,000 times per second, and that could get you leptons out there. That's certainly true. But there were, the starburst models I am aware of were being used to get you enough hadrons out to the, to the bubbles. But I find it's not consistent with my understanding of the star formation history of the bubbles. In terms of UV, it's way down by a factor of 100. You don't get any near, anywhere near the UV that you need to explain the stream emission. But Starburst winds do a lot. I mean, you see, you, you, I mean, there's lot, lots going on, but I just don't think they relate. Okay. If you're working on that, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I hate knocking back other people's work. So, Rush. so Josh, I just want to be sure I know what, you're, what you require. So you want that you need uh, an outburst of some sort from our galactic center a yeah. couple of million years ago. There should have been a burst of radiation again mm. in order to do something yeah. to the LMC. Big burst Three. of radiation. Yeah. But you also need, am I right, uh, output of mechanical energy in a yes. wind or jet? Yes. So this, this explosion should have done both. Yeah. And is it 10 to the 56 Earths in each, each of these two bands? Uh, you did ask me that. Um, it, it, it works out about that. Yes, it does work. It's, each, each needs about the same. That's like, <coughs> absolutely right. Okay. Now, you kept saying that this must have been a safer 0.18 turn or whatever. Yeah. But you really don't know that, right? It could have been any fraction of Eddington. Um, could it have been if you put the stream, the trouble with that is if... if Right now, the AGN looks good at 50 kiloparsecs and maybe even the shock cascade. If you put that stream much further out, like everybody wants it, it starts to get really hard. And that's why I say that you really want the maximum output you can, you can ever get in conventional accretion disk physics. You know, and Eddington, I presume you can't be super Eddington. Well, that was my question. Yeah, well, that, well that's where my beaming factor comes in. Uh -huh. So that makes you very happy because I could have that any number you like. You know, I could make that 10 or 100. <laughs> And I'm laughing. It's easy. You can put the stream at uh, 10 megaparsecs and I can light it up. Okay, I think we should talk before you <laughs> catch your plane because if you have a couple of Eddington accretions, it very naturally produces half of its output in the wind, half of its output in radiation. Oh, that's a very... I it looks that. just like an AGN as far I as... I read one of your reviews. I should have known that. Actually, I did kind of know that in the back of my mind. <laughs> That's an interesting point. So I should tell you that the, the work that's coming, you're going to get ionization diagnostics up to like carbon, you know, much higher ionization states. So if it's going to be blasting with a beam factor, I presume the radiation field must be hardened. So you must go hard to soft. So therefore, the, high, the highest ionization states, and maybe where you see that very, very bright H alpha, you know, it gets to 80, 800 millirated. Maybe that's consistent with some kind of focusing of the radiation field, and the radiation field is a lot softer as you go off in azimuth, in, in polar angle. So actually, whatever model you come up with will be testable soon with HST class. Okay. Because there can be many more ions observed. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, I think that would be my guess. I've completely that forgotten if about If our galactic center did something, maybe it went briefly super Eddington and kind of pretty much produced both of the things you need. But how narrow would Super Eddington be? Would it be, what, what sort of Lorentz factors would be? Oh no, it'll be very modest, Lorentz factor-wise. So it could be it's tens of degrees, still resolvable. It's not some sort of pencil beam. No. Yeah. It'll be, yeah, tens of degrees. Well, we have the perfect screen to test that. Good. That's an amazing concept. Thank you. Tony. 
Well, thank you, Drew. The uh, interstellar medium in the Galactic Center comes in nice convenient lumps of 10,000 to 100,000 solar masses at a time. And it, it all has to be moving inward at some relatively solar rate. If you have a sphere around the Galactic Center, it all is moving inward at about a solar mass per year crossing that boundary, and it can't all get into the black hole because otherwise the black, black hole would be a billion solar masses and okay. not okay. worth million solar masses. Yeah. So it has to go somewhere. It's likely to arrive in lumps, and so it's not surprising that the black hole would be fed episodically with you know 10 million or a few million kind of. Uh, I agree with the sentiment, but that's where ADAF, REAF. ADOS, I can't even remember all these acronyms, but that's where these models came from. I mean, you have this enormous amount of gas in clumps. You can resolve them, I and mean, the Bondi radius is, what is it, a few odd seconds or something? You know, it's, it, you're, you're down the scale, lot, and you see all this junk flying around, and the question is, why isn't it firing up at 10 to minus 4 or, or 3, I think, so, you know, let alone 10 to minus 8? So, that, that's I agree with you, but the, the thing is, you don't see it right now, yet you have all that junk down there. You know, dynamically, it can't, it can't fall in piecemeal. It has to fall in in lumps because uh, the, the dynamics of, uh, of the material in the bar simply won't let it, right? It, it, it has to kind of go in in million solar mass. I think bar dynamics, I'm not, I, I don't want to offend anyone who does biodynamics, but that's something I'm familiar with with the galaxy, doing all that work. But it's very difficult to get biodynamics working for you on these scales. You're way inside, you know, you're in sort of X2 orbits and stuff. You're way, way inside the electric potential. Mm. And that's where the flickering is coming from. That's where flicker, no uh, what I understand by flicker noise from the electronics journals is you basically have lots of impulses. You know, so like, uh, just, from, just pardon me for a moment. If you imagine you have water droplets, I know people get angry, but it's not really the correct analogy with accretion, but water, if you drop water onto a hot plate, if the whole water droplet, because the surface tension goes bang, because it hits, all the water, water breaks up when it hits there, and you get, and you get lots of little events. You, you with me? Lots of little events that basically um, break up, and, 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 they, and by virtue of breaking up and dispersing, there's a time domain. And that's how they get this one over F noise in transistors, for example. You have lots of impulses, like one big or the, the big one, but the thing that was going to be big becomes little. You get a spectrum of little things. Now, in accretion disks, it's something like that with regard to um, stuff being stretched across different parts of the disk, you know, local Eddington effects. And, I mean, they need, they need, they need it, to, it may come in a whole, as a whole, but it goes piecemeal somewhere, which is where the flickering, I think, comes from, I think. Right. So, uh, I, you haven't laughed, laughed yet, Roman. <laughs> <laughs> but I can tell you accretion disks are not water droplets. <laughs> <laughs> I told it to undermine people's work to say such a trivial thing. Charles will be here tomorrow, so uh, maybe we'll thank our speaker again and. Uh, <laughs>